Um, it has been really fun to, to prepare this morning, but I have to confess that there is way more than we could ever um, cover. So we're just going to do some highlights, and I hope this will kind of whet your appetite for further study on your own. I'd like for you to take your Bibles, <coughs> excuse me, as we begin this morning, and turn to Psalm, um, I just want to make sure I have the right number, Psalm 63. One of the things about the Psalms is that they are meant to be read in community. That um, so often um, we, we do read these alone, but the context is really the worshiping community. So I would like for us to read together this psalm. As we read, watch for the movement in the psalm, because there's, um, there's more than one thing going on. It's, it's a little bit like Psalm 139, where all of a sudden something happens. Or there's a change or a shift in mood. So pay attention as we read together. <laughs> Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. As in a dry and weary land, where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is satisfied as if with a rich cheese, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I think of you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be prey for the shackles. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exalt, for the mouth of liars will be stopped. I finally got my mic on here, so. So I want to know what comes to mind for you when you hear the word Psalms. What, what do you... Praise. 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 Poetry. Poetry. Psalms. Psalms. Pardon? David. David. Question. I'm sorry, but. Question. 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 Okay. Praise. Praise. Peace. Peace. Are there snippets of songs that come to mind? Twenty third song. Twenty third song. What part of that comes to your mind? It's a very uh, tender, loving, supportive song. If you will, it shows that uh, the person has gone out to a better world. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When I, even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. What other phrases from the Psalms have lingered in your mind? Perhaps from childhood, perhaps before the Psalms. He brought me up into an open place. He delivered me because he delighted me. He brought me out into an open place. He delivered me because he delighted me. What a great yeah, How about that? <laughs> what else? Yeah. When I was uh, getting ready to go to Rwanda, which was my first trip to a third world country, um, I um, kept going back in my head to Psalm 139, to the first half of it anyway, because <laughs> um, I, I had a sense that, um, I mean, I was scared because I really didn't know what to expect. And I kept thinking, you know, okay, God, you know where I am. You know where I'm going. And I found that really a big buoyancy in getting ready to go. And then as I was there, just kept coming back to me. Um, and it was 
it's a really wonderful song. Except for the last piece of it. Yeah. Psalm 139. If you aren't familiar with it, jot that number down. It's such a gift about God knowing exactly where we are when we rise and when we sit before a word is even on our lips. Other phrases. I like for similar to a little bit to a piece. Before surgery, someone gave me a, 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 a one verse from Psalm 4. It's the last one. I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you will know no more. I will lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord, help me dwell in the safety. What a wonderful promise. One more. Yeah, yeah. I was stupid and ignorant. I was like a brute beast before you. Nonetheless, you continue to call my hand and talk all this with me. Okay, say that one more one more time in a loud voice. I can't repeat all of it. I was stupid and ignorant. I was like a brute beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you and you hold my right hand. Isn't that good news? We can be stupid and like a brute beast, and yet God is with us holding our hand. Such a gift. I feel like that often. Yeah. I like that the God at times can be such a wrathful God. They're ready to kill everybody off, and at the end, He was a forgiving God that we took the people that had sinned against God and we still ready to give them freedom. The many faces of God that we discover in the Psalms. What is a psalm? The psalm, as Martha said, is poetry. That's enough to scare some people off. Um, but it's the poetry of the reign of God. The Psalms affirm, every one of them, even the ones that are ones that we might not choose to read, affirm that, you know, ultimately, God is sovereign. God is in control. God doesn't necessarily control, but God is in control. Psalms are the praise and proclamation and prayer of those who believe that the confession, the Lord reigns, states the basic truth about the world and the life lived within it. Even when it doesn't look like it's true. I'd like you to turn to Psalm 47 with me. Let's read that together. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is awesome, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of the trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a song. God is King over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Poetry of the reign of God. The, what is a psalm? It's the poetry of, poetry of the reign of God and of the reality of the not yet. The campaign to consummate the reign of God in the world continues. Nations rage against it. People ignore and subvert it. All who seek to live in the reign of God are caught in the conflict and endure the incompleteness. Turn to Psalm 13. So it's such a great reminder that what we know is going to be true um, ultimately where God is, is totally king of the earth, but we don't see it as much now. God is still there. Um, would one of you read the first section of uh, Psalm 13? How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Keep going, Elise. Thank you. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have to bail. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart will rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, 
because he has dealt bountifully with me. Did you see that movement back and forth? There's that sense of, God, you are the one, your steadfast love is what I trust in, and yet here's what I'm going through. And that's the beauty of the Psalms, this back and forth movement, that we know the reign of God, that God is in control, and yet we don't always see it. But we can trust that God. What is a Psalm? It's a book of praises. I think when we were doing the uh, lament in the spring, we talked about this, that the, in Hebrew, the word for the book of Psalms is the tehelim. And this means praises. So this it covers the whole of the Psalms in which we are going to find lament, we're going to find confessions, we're going to find songs of worship, we're going to find uh, a wedding song. All these different parts of uh, the Psalms come under this rubric, this umbrella of praise. Everything is praise when we bring it to God. Now here's... Oops, I, it's, it's kind of French. Character in the psalm, characters in the psalms. Um, we're going to see different words, and some of these are hard. Servants of the Lord. We acquire, who acquire their identity by having the Lord as Lord. That's pretty good. Enemies. How many of you have struggled in the psalms with the enemies, talking over and over and over again about the enemies? They are the counterpart to servants. They stand in the way of and disturb shalom, which is the wholeness, the goodness, the integrity of rational existence, relational existence with God. In other words, a relationship with God, self, and others. So we have this counterpart between the servants of the Lord and the enemies. The enemy and the enemies. Um, when I was growing up and memorizing these psalms, I kept trying to picture what the enemies were like out there. And what I've realized is, the, is that the enemies so aptly describe what's going on in here. Enemies like fear, enemies like self-doubt, enemies, um, you, name, you name it, they become enemies that keep us from that sense of well-being. And so when we read in the Psalms, Lord, deal with the enemies, I think, yes, deal with, help me to deal with this fear inside of me. It reads me. The righteous are those who live and speak in the ways that affirm that reign of God, so, so similar to the servants of the Lord. The opposite of the righteous is the wicked. So in Psalm 1, which is the, one of the introductory psalms, it talks about the, the um, righteous, what the person who is blessed, who focuses on and meditates on God's word, and it says the wicked are not so. So there's it's automatically set up this dichotomy. The lowly, the poor, the needy, the humble, those who know their dependence on the Lord. And then the arrogant, the ruthless, and the proud is their counterpart. So we're going to see this kind of conversation between these two sets of people. The structure of the Psalms, um, just briefly, there are two introductory Psalms, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. They set up the whole picture of what we're going to learn. So the first Psalm, let's actually read that. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read... Um, the Psalm 1 from the message. There are many translations of the Psalms, and um, I, one of the things that these different translations or paraphrases do for me is to kind of broaden my perspective on what is there. Sometimes they'll give me a clue to what I don't understand in one version, and then there's another. So Psalm 1, if you, um, if you want to, you can turn to it, but this... this um, this is a fun translation. Um, Eugene Peterson talks about the earthiness of the Psalms, that what we have tried to do at times is to kind of sanitize them, and, um, and they become kind of culturally um, upper class in the language. He says, no, that's not the picture in the Hebrew at all. It's really earthy language. So listen to the way he, he translates this. How well God must like you. You don't hang out at Sin Saloon. You don't slink along Dead End Road. You don't go to Smart Mouth College. Instead, you thrill to God's Word. You chew on Scripture day and night. You're a tree replanted in Eden, bearing fresh fruit every month, never dropping a leaf, always in blossom. You're not like all the wicked, who are mere wind-blown dust without defense in court, unfit company for innocent people. God charts the road you take. The road they take is skid row. 
So this picture is those who will pay attention to God's word, will pay attention to the Psalms, to pay attention to the rest of the, the Tanakh, which we've been looking at. They are the ones who are going to prosper. They'll be like that tree by water. I'm going to pass this around. This is a wonderful um, volume that has, has a couple of paintings with some of um, the Psalms that Eugene Peterson has translated. It's kind of fun to, to see. Psalm 2 talks about the nations. And so it gives us a clue that part of, the, part of what we're going to look for in the Psalms is this sense of obedience and meditating on God's word, being planted. And the other part is that, the, that though the nations are in an uproar, God is still in charge. Then the, after the first two um, Psalms, there are five books, each ending with a doxology. How do we, what is a doxology? Doxo? Song of Praise. Song of Praise. We sang the doxology, those of you who are in the first service. We sang that this morning. It's just a song of praise. And uh, will someone turn to Psalm 30 to 41 and read us the final verse that um, is the doxology there? Okay, so each one of them has something like this. Let's look at the one for Psalm 73, the end of the second book. Anyone? The very last verse? Um, it's Psalm 72, sorry, I got that wrong. Yeah, um, from 18 on. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the whole earth. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, son of Jesse, are ended, it says there, which probably means that David was very familiar with the Psalms in those first two books. And um, that was, this. these uh, Psalms have been, uh, compiled over a very long period of time. The earliest one is by Moses, Psalm 90. goes all the way to the time after the exile when the children of Israel leave Babylon and they go back to <coughs> Jerusalem. Um, so it, it has this wide swath of uh, time. And these would have been collected by oral tradition and then put together into um, the, the whole book of Psalms. So it should be Psalm 72, so book 3 is 73 to 89, book 4, 90 to 106, and book 5, Psalm 107 to 145. And that is, what might that be mirroring? mirroring? What other set of five do we know? The Pentateuch. the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And so there's that sense that these also mirror this. When you know these Psalms and you know the um, Pentateuch, you really know who God is. Then at the end, there are five psalms of praise with a great doxology, which is um, a song of praise in, one, in Psalm 150. Um, I had a devotional that every day we read one of those last five psalms of praise over and over and over, so the cycle just kept repeating itself. It was amazing what happened to me when every time I would come to this psalm, I think, oh, I'm in a different place than I was last time I read this. But just draws, it really drew my heart in praise. The authors, you'll see in the inscriptions, which often have been put in later, but that will have Psalms of David, Moses, Solomon, Asaph, the sons of Korah, or the Kor Korahites, who were gatekeepers in the temple. Um, again, it's just this a whole collection of people. Sometimes when it says um, a psalm of David, it means that David used that psalm. It doesn't necessarily mean that he wrote it. The another time, and we'll look at Psalm 3 later, um, it says a psalm of David while he was fleeing from his son Absal Absalom. There are 13 psalms that have been identified with a specific time in David's life. And so um, we, we, we still don't know, but that, that could be very appropriate. I told you the dates are the early time in Israel's history, the time of compilation, the poetry, I've talked about that, all kinds of different poems, 
songs of thanksgiving, worship, instruction, confession, petition, <coughs> celebrations. One of the things that is true of the Psalms is that there are really three seasons of life that we find in the Psalms. We find Psalms of orientation, those seasons that are um, sense of well-being, the joy, delight, awareness of God's goodness. Um, Psalm 103 is one, is one of those. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then it, the, all the b benefits of being one of God's children are listed. So this whole sense that, yep, everything is right with the world. There are days when those Psalms really mirror my experience. <laughs> there are other days when um, there are times of disorientation, when it's easy to say, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Um, on that sheet of paper that I gave you, it has not the handout, but the um, scripture. I put Psalm 3 and I put Psalm 69. How often is this really the, the um, feeling that we have as we come before God? Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink deep in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me and he goes on and on about the place that he is, that place of real disorientation. Sometimes the, the, in disorientation we'll read expressions of rage, of resentment, of self-pity, of hatred, of agony. It's again pretty earthy. The language is suitably extravagant, hyperbolic, and abrasive. And it may be a personal and intimate issue that the um, psalmist is writing about, or a massive and public one. And yet, no matter what it was, these were all a part of the worship of God. The final kind, uh, season in the Psalms is reorientation, that time when um, we have suddenly recognized that joy has broken into our despair. Look at Psalm 40 real quickly. Would someone just read the first three verses, please? I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the weary ball, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear, and put their trust in me. So where had the psalmist been? A miry bog. What else? A desolate pit. This place of hopelessness where he was stuck. And he says, I waited for the Lord in that awful place. And, yet, and here God heard me and has given me a new song to sing. So that's that sense of reorientation. So if the Psalms are fundamentally movement about between these seasons, and I have to say our lives, I think, are fundamentally movement between these three seasons, one of the things to pay attention to as we're reading, and actually in my own life as well, is the transitions. Because it's easy, if things are going well, I can, I, I'm secure. If things are not going so well, but I've kind of gotten used to it, I'm there. When things are reoriented, I pretty soon it's just that I'm back to the cycle of orientation. And the reorientation, that new place becomes a, um, where I am most comfortable. It's these in between points that are so important. So between orientation and disorientation, it's that sense of lament. This is not the way it's supposed to be. And you'll notice this is so much, you'll find these songs of lament. Um, there are 40% of the psalms are lament psalms. So this transition between orientation and disorientation is something that psalmists are very familiar with. And then, between disorientation and reorientation, there's this surprise. It's that sense of, oh, God, you did show up. And um, the hope of the resurrection is a song of thanksgiving. So there's often this, this um, sense that our transitions are the ones that we need to pay attention to. You know, have you ever done one of those um, timelines where they say to put the high points or, or whatever kind of point you want to put on your, trans on your timeline, and it's like you just kind of are there. 
I took a class where they said, don't look at those things as much as look at the transition between those things, because that's when something's going on in your life. That is often the place where God meets us. So the psalm, book, the psalm is the prayer book of God's people. This is what Eugene Peterson says about the psalms. They're real, honest, earthy, and rough. Not genteel, not the prayers of nice people couched in cultured language. Athanasius, who lived in the fourth century, said, they become like a mirror to the person singing them. The psalms are often sung. And then uh, Kathleen Norris in the Cloister Walk, she says, the mundane and the holy are inextricably mixed. The mundane, the everyday life, and the holiness of God are mixed. And uh, what she says in this book, The Cloister Walk, is the Psalms begin to read us. Um, if you're not familiar with The Cloister Walk, the um, article I put there, Why Psalms Scare Us, is taken from this book. Um, I said on the um, handout, if you want to email me, because I, I think we ran out of copies, I'll send it to you, um, send the article to you. But she is um, Kathleen Norris. Uh, Many of you may have read her book, Dakota, or some of the other books that she's written. She spent two seasons of nine months in a Benedict, Benedictine monastery, where every three hours they read the Psalms or sing the Psalms. And so she was immersed in the Psalms. And uh, she has some wonderful things to say. Um, The Benedictine method of reading psalms with long silences between them rather than commentary or explanation takes full advantages of the paradoxes between the mundane and the holy, offering almost alarming room for interpretation and response. It allows the psalms their full power, their use of imagery and hyperbole. To the modern reader of the Psalms, it can seem, but to, but to the modern reader, the Psalms can seem impenetrable. How the world, how in the world can we read, let alone pray, these angry and often violent poems from an ancient warrior culture? Maybe you felt that way. At a glance, they seem overwhelmingly patriarchal, ill-tempered, moralistic, vengeful, and often seem to reflect precisely what is wrong with our world. Have you ever thought that? And that's the point, or part of it. As one reads the Psalms every day, it becomes clear that the world they depict is not really so different from our own. The fourth century monk Athanasius wrote that the Psalms become like a mirror to the person singing them. And this is as true now as when he wrote it. The Psalms remind us that the way we judge each other with harsh words and acts of vengeance constitutes injustice. And they remind us that it is the powerless in, the, in society who are overwhelmed when injustice becomes institutionalized. This picture that um, this anger, the rage, the vengeance in the Psalms depicts what's going on in our world is really important for us to grasp. That's why these become important um, vehicles of our worship to God, because if we're honest, we too feel some of those things, um, and it's okay. The value of this great songbook of the Bible, Kathleen Norris writes, is, lies not in the fact that singing praise can alleviate pain, but that the painful images we find there are essential for praise, that without them, praise is meaningless. This meaningless praise becomes the dreadful cheer that Minnesota writer Carol Bly has complained of in generic American Christianity which blinds itself to pain and therefore makes a falsehood of its praise. I don't know about you, but what? Oh my gosh. Um, I hope you're at your lunch. <laughs> um, I don't know what kind of background you grew up in, but um, I grew up where, in a background where we just tried to cover over anything that was hard. And that church became a place of this um, generic American Christianity where it was kind of a dreadful cheer at times. And that point that we have to wrestle with the pain is really um, important. Okay, so what do we do with the violence in the Psalms? I read that section on, um, in the Cloister Walk in 93. Um, I think we still just continue to wrestle with it. But uh, there is also that sense... Um, 
Well, let, let's go on to this next one because it's related. What about the Psalms which curse the enemy? Psalm 69 is such a good example of that. And on the back of your sheet with the scripture on it, um, here's what the psalmist prays in verse 25 or 24. No, we're into 22. Let their table be a trap for them. These are his enemies. A snare for their allies. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. And make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one live in their tents. For they persecute those whom you have struck down. And those whom you have wounded, they attack still more. Add guilt to their guilt. These are called imprecatory psalms. And I want to make a case that these are important for us. These are usually black, blocked out of uh, worship. They're, they never appear in the lectionary, which is the set of, of scriptures for Sundays or for days. You know, it'll say you can skip this part. This is optional. But there's something to be said for these imprecatory psalms where you're, this, the psalmist just gets going cursing. Wherever we find imprecation in scripture, it is not triumphalistic or gloating. Instead, it issues from a position of weakness and victimization. Um, I've given you some um, psalms to look up. I want you to wrestle with this because you may think, ah, I'm not so sure, Cheryl, but um, I want you to wrestle with it. Imprecation recognizes God as the sole source of deliverance and righteous judgment. The only one laughing at the wicked is God himself. In imprecation, we acknowledge our impotence and participation in the per persecuted body of Christ. We let go of the need for revenge and hand over vengeance to God, the ultimate worker of justice. God desires to hear honest prayer in all circumstances. The expression of anger can be transformed. Imprecation reveals the brokenness in our world and in ourselves and the need to work together to repudiate systems of injustice in every guise. You will find in these psalms where they're, they're, um, all these curses are there. Listen to what this, how the psalmist continues after this in verse 29. He's railed on his enemies. And then he says, but I am lowly and in pain. Aha. Let your salvation, O God, protect me. I pray, will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns or hoofs. In his imprecation, the psalmist has brought all these feelings to God and God has met him there. Psalm 3 um, is on your sheet. I invite you to work on that this week. I've given you some questions that you can work on there. I also invite you to watch the um, Psalms video. I have to say that it, it kind of got me like this when I watched it, so I decided this was not for us. Um, but it's fascinating the way that um, the makers of this video have laid out these first two Psalms and then the five books and then the five praise at the end, um, looking at themes and all. I, I would encourage you to watch it because it, it can be really helpful. End of slideshow. Thank you. Um, Thank you for bearing with me. I would invite you to um, take the Psalms seriously. I don't know if you worked at them this last week, but I invite you to take one Psalm a day and just ha ask, how can this be, how can this shape my prayer? How is this going to be shaping my life? Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, and I invite all of you who are going to second service to take the opportunity to leave if you wish. And maybe if you have questions for Cheryl, she can... Uh, answer those um, at your leisure and her leisure. Um, we pray, Father, that uh, you would help us to understand the Psalms better. Thank you so much for the overview given us this morning. Help us to understand that these are instructive and um, ways that we can uh, read the Psalms and understand you better. We pray this in your name. Amen. I forgot. I, I have a. Um, I just want to quickly show you these two things. Um, one is